Stories often grow as they are told and retold. Details are added or remembered or embellished. And especially the great stories of scripture that provided so much of the memories of the people of God as generation passed them on to generation. Those stories developed and became even more wonderful for their hearers. And one of these great stories is one we heard today from the book of Exodus, the story of this miraculous gift of food called manna, uh, similar to the Hebrew word that means, what is this? And it got that name. And the description of how it was given and what it was like continues to grow as the scriptures repeat this story. Exodus, for example, tell us that the manna tasted like wafers made of honey. But the next book, the book of Numbers, says that the people could gather it and grind it and cook it and make loaves of it, and the finished product had a rich, creamy taste. Some would even say that it was like a cake made with oil. Uh, Psalm 78, which was the uh, proper psalm for today's Mass, says that the manna is the bread of angels, food sent in abundance. And then finally, just before the time of Jesus, the Book of Wisdom comes along, and in this book, the manna almost has kind of magical properties to it. It's such a wonderful gift, and the way the Book of Wisdom describes the manna, it says that it was bread from heaven, ready to hand, untoiled for, endowed with all delights, conforming to every taste, going on to say that it served the desire of the one who received it and changed to whatever flavor each one wished. What an amazing gift of food that would have been. But part of the message was not just the wonder of the manna, it was the, the fact that God provides. God always provides. And what is even more important in this story, God is faithful and God can be trusted. The 430 years that the Israelites spent in the land of Egypt robbed them of their ability to trust. The experience of slavery, as well as other traumatic experiences, even in today's world that people can go through, such as an experience of abuse, especially of sexual abuse, shatters something within the person they can't trust anymore. And that deep wound continues to prevent them from entering into healthy relationships. So the gift of manna was given not just as food, but it was given as a way to restore the people's ability to trust, to trust in God. And then God was showing them that yes, indeed, a healthy relationship was possible, a relationship with God, and even their relations with one another could be transformed. And this trust would be partly about a mature kind of obedience, one that is done out of love, out of devotion, and that there would even be a life-giving kind of dependence, an ability to receive with gratitude gifts of one another and gifts of God. All of this was not just about food, not just about feeding, but God teaching his people a better way to live. The impulse of the newly freed slaves, we are told in Exodus, was simply to grab and to hoard this food as it became available, because that's what fear and anxiety does to us. We become self-centered and selfish, and we become uh, possessive of the things we have. Uh, didn't we see that when the pandemic first came among us? People would go to stores and clear off the shelves, take everything they could, could imagine because of the fear that we were going to run out. And stores had to put up signs, just buy what you need, just for the, there'll be more, more is coming, don't worry. But people in their fear and anxiety panicked. So God had to teach them through the story of the manna to receive the food one day at a time, no more, no less. Whatever amount was really needed and God would always provide as promised. And if the people tried to hoard it, it would not last. Toward the end of the journey through the desert, Moses in the book of Deuteronomy reminded the people about this gift and that it was given to draw them close to God. 
He said, remember, for 40 years, the Lord your God directed your journeys. He fed you with manna, food unknown to you and your ancestors, so that you might know it is not by bread alone that people live, but by what comes forth from the mouth of God. It wasn't the food, it was the companionship, the relationship, as we even say sometimes when we have a meal with friends, it's not the food, it's the company. That's what God was teaching the people to enjoy. And God's purpose was then to restore the people, to bring them into friendship with himself and in deeper relationship with one another. God's plan was to enlarge their hearts, to make them eventually compassionate to others who were hungry and suffering, to make them generous and not hoarders, not selfish. And so manna truly was a gift of transformation. With memories like this in the backs of the minds of God's people, the Israelites, the people of Jesus' time surely had high expectations when he began to speak to them about the bread from God, the bread from heaven. Could Jesus possibly do more than the gift of manna? Could he do better than Moses did? So when Jesus speaks of the true bread, the bread of God that gives life to the world, what could he possibly be offering them? And what Jesus eventually offers is so far beyond their expectation they can hardly grasp it, hardly believe in it. For he declares that he himself is the bread from heaven, that he is the divine source of life. As God, he is both the giver and the gift. That's what they're being invited to receive. The bread from heaven is Jesus himself, the new manna. He's the message and the word of life, the real bread from heaven, the real word of life that is for all time. What can we do in response to that offer? What should we do? Jesus simply says, believe me, trust me, this gift is for you. And as transforming as it was for the people of his time, the gift of Eucharist that Jesus gives transforms us. Here is God's new gift to us, this new manna from heaven, given to us for healing and renewal and growth and expansion and transformation. We are taking into our souls and bodies in this Eucharist the immortal one, the infinite one, and that will change us if we let it. We can indeed eat the sacrament and overlook the reality, not really receive the fullness of the gift if we're not aware of what it is we are receiving. What's really happening to us at this moment of Eucharist, this moment of communion? So often we know, unfortunately, we have to rush to church. Uh, church is busy, it's kind of noisy, we're doing a lot of things, we try to settle into what Mass is about, and. We come, we receive, and then we leave and we're on to our next event of the day, our next task. There's hardly any time just to sit with the Lord and absorb the gift that we've received, to savor what is being given to us, to let it see how this gift has come to us to satisfy the particular need that we have for God's transforming presence in our lives. Jesus also wants to draw us into friendship. Jesus wants to pull us closer to himself and make our hearts like his own. Jesus wants to free us from our particular slaveries and the wounds and hurts of our lives and wants to feed our deeper hungers. He wants us to come to him and recognize in him that he is what we're really hungry for. And it is from this healing and this transforming love, this gift that Jesus gives us, that we then let him send us forth so that we, like the people of Israel, can also become people of compassion, expanding our hearts to be aware of the sufferings and the hungers of our world so that we can also begin to feed them with that same presence of God that is within us. But we cannot do it if we are not aware of what God is doing within us. It was a wonderful custom years ago when churches could 
remain open all day and all night, that people could simply come and sit before the Blessed Sacrament and there to savor and receive more deeply and more personally the gift of Jesus for them. That's so hard to do anymore, but still we can, in receiving this gift, we are taking it home with us so that if there's any opportunity you may have today or this week to just go apart for a moment and savor and remember and speak to Jesus very personally about your needs, your hungers, and let him fill you, let him transform you. We cannot do the work of God unless we have God within us. So the, the Christian life is both about receiving and giving. There's the opportunity for activity, but there's also the need for contemplation and reflection so that we can continue to be fed and renewed inwardly with God so that we can give freely as God has given to us. So we pray today in this Eucharist as we celebrate and as we reflect on the greatness of this gift. May God renew us and feed us within. May God use us to feed those who are around us who also long and hunger for the gifts of his freedom and renewal that he has promised all of us who have faith in him.